Today on Hands On Photography, we're going to continue our discussion about product photography and brand photography and just working with brands. But it's not going to be me doing all the talking. I have a guest this week. Zach Sedawan is an amazing content creator and former creative director for several brands. And he's got quite a bit of information to share to help inspire you, help get you going on your journey with working with brands. Now stay tuned. This is Twit. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt. This is Hands On Photography here on Twit TV. Fine show where I like to sit down and share different tips and tricks to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. And every now and then I get the opportunity and pleasure and honor to sit down with some amazing photographers and content creators out and about in this wonderful creative space. And that's what this week is going to be about. But before we get into that, I want to say welcome to everybody that's joining the show for the very first time. Welcome. Go ahead and subscribe and whatever podcast application you're enjoying this on and make sure, please make sure you share the show out with everybody else that you think just might enjoy the world of photography and, and want to get into it and get better at it. And heck, if you feel like it, share it with an enemy, too. I don't mind at all. <laughs> but check us out on the website, twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography, where you'll see all of our subscription options over there, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as our YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe, share the show out, help grow the hands-on photography community. Now, preamble's out the way. Let's go ahead and get started with this week's guest, because right now I am sitting down with a former uh, creative director, now a current um, professional content creator, just doing all types of things. Um, some even quite strange <laughs> in creativity, but I got to tell you, he's a lot of fun. I have the honor and pleasure to meet Mr. Zach Sediwan, who actually used to be here in Petaluma. And right about the same time I decided to leave Charlotte, North Carolina to come to Petaluma, he pretty much did the reverse. Now he's in Charlotte, North Carolina. And as he said earlier, he probably just moved right into the same house that I was in. Who knows? But anyway, let's welcome Mr. Zach. How you doing, brother? How's it going? <laughs> so glad to see you. Appreciate you, you being here on the show, my man. Fast. <laughs> really appreciate you being here on the show. So, you know, you you told me previously that you used to pretty much be right around the corner from Twitch Studios. Is that true? I, mean, I did. I lived about five minutes from Twitch Studios, the Joby and Lopro headquarters. We're literally right across the street from where the, the studios are now, mm -hmm. not the brick house. Yeah. Um, jo Joby used to be in San Francisco when I first moved there. Uh -huh. And then they moved them both to the low pro location, which is kind of by the Applebee's or the IHOP right there. Applebee's on the corner. No, it's the IHOP. You're right. I -hop. There You're we go, correct. Right there. There's an IHOP right there. behind our building. <laughs> Wow, it's so daggum close. So I would come in the studio all the time on my lunch break and, you know, watch the shows and just sit there. Oh, dude. So, yeah, you go you way know. back. You go way back. I, I go back to the first day Leo went on the air. I'm 50. <laughs> So. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm glad to have you on and be, you know, being a, a pretty much a twit loyalist. It's really great to have another twit loyalist here on the show. And I really do appreciate that. But what I wanted to talk to you about this week is, you know, you, you're a former creative director. You just mentioned Joby and Lopro and previously here on hands on photography, I've gotten into doing product photography shots. I think it was episode 142. I don't know. Mr. Victor will have that up on the screen at some point. But we walked through just doing some product photography and shooting for brands and trying to understand what their message is um, and, and getting that to come out in the shots. So I know you know all about that, but tell me how episode. in the world did you get started with the likes of Joby and Lopro? 
Well, so the first thing was, you know, I, for a lot of people out there, you might not be in the field of photography, right? And I never went to a class. I have, still have not gone to a single class, seminar, read a book, read the instruction manual to my camera, any of that. Um, <laughs> I decided one day I was finishing up building a house and I thought I need something to do when I finish it. So I thought I'm gonna buy a camera and I'll make a television commercial. So I made a fake Nike commercial and uh, I put it out there on a website. About a week later, I got another job uh, from PBS New York. They came over, we filmed some live stuff. This was uh, film stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that day they hired me to go and work with them for three months on the East Coast. I did that. While I was doing that, um, I started doing more photos of behind the scenes and different things I was doing. And I was using a lot of Joby products. And right. I was a huge fan of Joby. Right. And then Joby was pretty small at that time. And they only had about a, a SKU count, which is a product count of about maybe um, six or seven items. Mm -hmm. Well, I would take behind the scenes photos of them all the time and send them to their person in their social media contact person. Right. And I was doing this nonstop. I wasn't asking for anything. They weren't giving me product. I was just sending it to them, telling them what I was doing and that I liked it and they would use it. And I was making sure I was sending them good shots. Yeah. <clears throat> So then after probably a good two or three years of this, um, I'd actually won the contest that Joby was having for a Canon 5D at the time. Um, I was then, you know, more and more, like they were getting content from me every other day while I was out working. I was working for like PBS, uh, PBS what? <laughs> channel, Dude. Speed Channel, um, trying to think what else, Honda motorcycles, a bunch of different things like that, that I was, at this time it was almost all film, but there was some yeah. photography. Um, so film as this. in video, you mean, right? Video, okay. video, like it was almost all gross. ads. It yeah. was either ads or like um, for PBS New York, it was these boring shows with like senators and congressmen where you would just fall asleep while you're doing it, but. No comment. So as I'm doing, <laughs> yeah, so as I'm sending this the, the stuff, you know, I see them start to use it. Yeah. And, uh, and I still don't ask for anything, but they start sending me stuff. Yeah. So that's one thing. If you're going to pick a brand that you want to start actually getting paid shooting, I would say pick a smaller brand that has a smaller SKU count, smaller product count. Yeah. If they have a really large one, the process becomes far more involved. It's so much and more bureaucratic at the bigger brands. It's more bureaucratic and the process, which I'll kind of touch on later, is a lot more difficult and you really just can't jump in because it just won't work with everything that's going on. Cause there's usually a team of like 10 people behind the scenes, just doing their products up there. Yeah. Um, so you pick a small brand, pick a brand, you know, pick a brand you are passionate about. So when I had the Joby product, everybody was coming up to me and asking me, what is that? What is that? And I was showing them nonstop and I was using it nonstop. Yep. That's exactly there. And uh, I love this. This is the five K and I've had this thing for, ever and it is a daggum tank i love it That's a good one. <laughs> so one day i'm listening to twit and i hear leo talking about how every tuesday the sonoma aroma yep which uh, <laughs> i know all smell, about that now uh, Luma smell <laughs> ends up happening every tuesday and i'm like this is weird because i know joby's pretty close to there so i call their social person and the uh, manager of joby answers uh, he's like, oh no, she uh, left lap yesterday. And I was like, oh, okay, no, I just have a question. Does it really smell like poop in Petaluma every Tuesday? And uh, he's like, actually it does. <laughs> and I was like, well, who's gonna replace Emily, the uh, content creator, so I have my contact back, or the social media person, so I have my contact back. And he says, well, how about you? And I was like, I don't know, I wanna live in San Francisco, but I'm not sure. So I jumped on a plane, the next day I was out there, I interviewed with the entire team and I think a week later, 10 days later, I started working there. In man, San Francisco. man. So you so, literally just called him up and said, you know, um, so-and-so is not like there. So when is she going to be back? Then yep. that, that just sort of opened the door. Yeah. He basically said, you know, I'm too lazy to hire anybody else. You're the first person to call. Do you want the job? But remember, <laughs> I had also been sending them content regularly and not asking for anything. That's right. So we had, you know, lots of people when, when I became, when I started working for them at first, I wasn't the creative director. I was pretty much the person in charge of all the, all the, uh, advocates and content creators. Okay. And the ones that ask for stuff all the time or right off the bat or say, Hey, I want to be paid to do it. You're, you're, I don't even think those emails are getting answered. Yeah. 
But the people who are passionate about the product and doing it on their own, those are the ones that we like. And those are the ones we're going to build relationships with and people who actually know and are genuine about it. Mm -hmm. Those are people also that are going to, if you're passionate about a product, you're going to follow, you're going to be in the brand, like, um, I don't know, ethos. You'll, you'll be the type of person that fits their brand. Right. So when you go to shoot something, you won't be shooting something out of character for what they want. Right. Right. Rather than if just like, you know, I picked up this water ball or whatever it is here and went to shoot it. I have nothing, no clue, you know, so I have to do a ton of research. Right. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I don't. Mm -hmm. So then, um, I did one photo shoot for them and, uh, after I did the one photo shoot, I got called up to the low pro office, which was much bigger. Yep. Joby, Joby was about 10 people. Low pro was 150, 60 people. Yeah. And they called me up there and they told me that I was going to do all the photography for them. And I said, no. <laughs> yeah, the Joby office was Wait a minute. Cool. Wait a minute. Why, why, why'd you say no? Why, why'd you tell them no? The Joby office, you know, we threw things off the roof of the San Francisco building. We yeah. like had fights in the, like food fights in the office. It was yeah. just crazy. Joby was awesome back in the day. Yeah. Now they're owned by Manfredo. And so um, yeah. it was really, really cool. <laughs> but then eventually the Joby office, the CEO closed it. And then he told me, hey, look, now you do have to work up here. So I worked up there and um, I told the creative director, I said, well, you know, you pretty much just bought your replacement up here. And I was, I was sitting in his desk the first day when I showed up there. Oh, you later on there, I was, I was a creative director of both brands. Wow. So, you know, you, it, it took a ton of work. I can't say that I just like lucked into it. Like the amount of time I was working Yeah. at Aluma, I would unlock the office at about six 45 or seven in the morning. And I would lock it and arm it at 10 or 11 at night six days a week. Wow, dude. That's a and lot. I, that, yeah. that, that's and on Sunday, quite a bit. I was location scouting. So that's that's quite a bit. Now, you you said a couple of things here that I find interesting that may need some clarification. Um cuz you 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 you're creating all of this content for them, uh speaking of Joby that is. You're creating all this content for them just because you felt like it and you were sending it to them. And yep. you didn't ask for anything. You didn't ask for compensation, anything like that. It did eventually lead to them bringing you into the fold and, you know, you being an employee. Now you are, let's be clear. You are not advocating artists do all of their work for free, right? No, I'm just going to say that if you're going to send stuff to a brand, if you're, if you're going to, and if they're advertising, Hey, we want a brand photographer mm -hmm. and they have a job listing for it. Yep. And you ask money for it right away. There you go. If you're sending them something, don't expect them to like be all, Oh, that's awesome. Why don't we give you a whole bunch of money for it? Thanks. Cause it's not going to happen that way, especially now, which is, it's just not going to work. You know, you, you have to build a relationship first. Yep. Especially, you know, if you don't have an in or a way in the door, they get so many requests, it's nonstop and they get stuff that's off brand and it's repeated. So it's just annoying. Um, yep. for, with Honda motorcycles, you know, for them, I started doing it the opposite. I started sending them uh, photos and then I ended up getting video work with them later on. So, you know, the photography was, I noticed that the local dealers where I were, the ads in the newspaper back then yeah. were, hor were horrific. <laughs> they were so bad. And then they were bad that as a, as a huge fan of Honda, I was yeah. embarrassed. Yeah. yeah. So I found out on my own who the, um, it was, I don't think it was a creative director. It was like the marketing director of Honda North America motorcycles was. And I started creating ads each week that were better than theirs and sending in the ads. Nice. And then I started getting hired by a whole bunch of dealers on the West coast, more than the people that more dealers hired me to create their ads than the people that were paying the outside company to make the ads that were bad. So <laughs> I was, I was just doing it and I was getting paid by the motorcycle dealerships independent uh, individually because mm -hmm. they liked, liked them. And then eventually later on that led, led to a really good relationship with the people working in Honda motorcycles who are right. unbelievably awesome. Um, and then they sponsored like a video documentary that I did. Uh, called Pursuit Horizon, which is on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And then later on, 
you know, I filmed um, Chasing 300, the world's fastest motorcycle, um, which is co-sponsored by Honda and a whole bunch of other brands like Dunlop. The Chasing 300 on one is that's that's that was quite quite fascinating, quite yeah, fascinating. <laughs> over a million plus views and thousand something comments, and um, but that one paid well. Yeah. So you know, but you got to figure for what I got paid for that, I probably put in. In the end, it probably probably made like four dollars an hour. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but there's legacy there. There's legacy there now. Really? You know, and it, that you saying you saying the 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 stuff about the motorcycle dealership. It reminds me, this is literally just two days old for me. Mm -hmm. I got a flyer in the mail, and I'm just flashing it because I don't want to incriminate anybody. But I got a flyer in the mail and this is from a real estate company and a mortgage company. And the first thing I saw was, boy, these are some horrible headshots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these are some horrible headshots. So I kept this flyer and it has all of their contact information on them. And I've already pitched them, basically told them, look, I got this in the mail. Let me help you out. <laughs> Let me help you out. And sometimes it takes that type of of effort uh, to be able to get your business going is just notice where a problem is and, and offer a solution to a problem to the, to the clients that are out there. The, the motorcycle shop, the motorcycle shop had a lot of great products, but they wasn't doing the products any justice by presenting something in images that just looked really, really bad. And you stepped in to to fix that for them. And I only did it because I felt embarrassed by the ad. <laughs> so, I mean, I've ridden motorcycles since I was four years old. Um, oh, but. that's awesome. I used to ride dirt bikes when I was a kid. We used to have um, Kawasaki. We had the KD80. Yeah, KDX80. And then we had the, the CRs. Yes. The Honda, Honda, Honda CR. CRs. 250s. Used to love riding those through the woods. Loved it. I've had 34 motorcycles to date. Good grief, man. <laughs> I started, started a month I turned, right there, like a month before I turned four years old, and I've never not had a motorcycle. Man. I met, I met my wife filming a motorcycle documentary. Oh, dude. She yeah. rides motorcycles. One of these days, I'm going to be as cool as you when I grow up. One of these days. <laughs> so that's, that's, yeah, that's quick, you. Quick, quick huh? tip about those uh, headshots for other people. Mm hmm. You know, no matter how great you take the photos, you had a guy on the other day who was in North Carolina. I can't remember his name. Mike um, Wilson. Man, talk about that guy's humble when he was on your show. Mm -hmm. His work is phenomenal. Sure is. Good. And he was so humble. Mm -hmm. But I was like, Mike, come on, man, have some coffee. <laughs> but if you're just doing it, you know, for a few people or friends, if you put a full size mirror next to your camera, they'll like the photos. Yeah. No matter what the quality of the photos are. And the reason is, is because before they come to take the photo, they're going to stand in the mirror and they're going to make their like Zoolander face there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when they go to try to do it, they're going to forget. So instead mm -hmm. of the perfect like blue yeah. steel, they'll yeah. be like, right. <laughs> but if they look in the mirror right next to you, they'll get their perfect blue steel. Yeah. And then. Yeah. Love the photo because they'll love just the way they look. Because the, the, the way they posed and, mm -hmm. you know, like they had some control over that. That's a good tip. Yep. Good tip. Good tip. Now, um, again, you, you not only have you been doing some product photography, you've been doing lifestyle photography for these brands, too. And that's something that's always fascinated me. Because um, when companies do their photography for their product is usually just, you know, a stand, the product and a couple bric-a-brac around it is accents to, you know, sort of fill up the frame or what have you. I've always thought the lifestyle um, marketing shots are way more compelling, but I'm pretty sure there's so much more research that has to go into it. And you've done a lot of stuff for like low pro and a couple of the images that, that I looked at of yours were just unbelievable. And it just really helped tell the story of what they were trying to offer. Tell us a little bit about your experience with just shooting lifestyle photography, lifestyle so product photography, I should say on a lot of the lifestyle photography, mm -hmm. especially with low pro. So with low pro, what I figured is, you know what, I'm going to make my models actual photographers. That's one thing I changed. Okay. I didn't. So there are a few times that we use models, but a lot of times whenever I could, I tried to actually find a photographer and use a photographer okay. because 
a photographer will work for beans if they think they're going to be on the cover of like a low pro thing or featured in it <laughs> you can give them nothing they will work and a photographer knows how hard it is yeah so they will start at six in the morning or you could wake up and go oh it's 3 a.m but look at the fog outside let's run out there and do the photos and they are so into the art aspect of it mm -hmm. that they will want to do it they won't right. care a model and eh, models aren't going to be like that if you're paying them there's mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a difference there um so like like this guy on the front there, mm -hmm. you know, he's a, um, he's a photographer. Um, so the first thing I would always do when I go to do that, besides picking someone, yeah. um, and I, I, when it comes to models, look everywhere, look everywhere you possibly can. Um, I went one time for a video and I went to like three different scout places in San Francisco, look for it, couldn't find anything on the way back towards Reno. I stopped at a Starbucks. And the barista, I made him come out and do a uh, audition in front of the store and I ended up using him. <laughs> and he was awesome. You never know, right? Uh, right. That's where I've got people from the gym there in Petaluma, right next to where you are. Yeah, Synergy. Um, I just stop people. I will like run out of my car and grabs one. <laughs> to use as a, uh, and they might think it's weird, but you know, um, there was a, a girl I saw at a BMX park, Nikita Ducros. And, you know, she was posting stuff saying that she was like a Joby advocate uh, athlete. So I went and I saw her at this uh, BMX place and she was like super timid and shy. And she was just perfect. She was like the perfect Joby person who would never come to us or be a model or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, she was just in the X Games. And wow. she won, I think, bronze or something like that. Um, wow. You know, you know, you never know who you're going to meet with this. So don't be limited. Usually pretty people sometimes don't make the best models. Um people with like harsh lines on their face or um, that are more interesting mm -hmm. sometimes work. You also need to pick person that's going to match the brand. Yeah. Um, for yeah. That kind of stuff. Also with models, and this is a big thing with lifestyle photography. If you actually pay a model or you talk, you have a photographer and you have them there, you need to explain to them that once we start shooting, it's a hundred percent professional yeah. and they need to realize, and, and you got to tell them look, I'm super nice guy, but when we start, you are an object that I am using in my right, photo. right. Your yeah. job, and I'm paying you, and in usually we pay like vision. fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a day. Yeah, is you do exactly what I tell you. Yeah, period. And and I would see some other photographers sit there, and they the session would start going, and they would get too friendly at, during during the shoot and they'd be like it's okay if you're hot don't worry about it or no it, it, if you don't want to move that way it, it's okay and they'd be too soft and start doing that and the yeah. photos would would suck right they would just not be great so you got to be harsh like that you got to be like right on and then uh, you always have to be super professional especially if you're dealing with a uh, model with the opposite sex mm -hmm. i know there's a huge thing of what people think like you know Yep. Uh, professional photographers do that's totally not real if you are even thinking that or you like try to go that way well then you can just put yourself back to like craigslist or something because you'll never be a professional photographer anyone that mm -hmm. anyone takes serious um, no, in my experience when dealing with the opposite sex on 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 set or uh, in studio what have you if you're very very open and direct about the direction none of that alleged stuff is going to happen you know yep. um for example if even if you're doing video and you, and you want to put it if and you want to put a lavalier mic on them hi I, I okay i have a lavalier mic and i need to put this on your shirt right here next to your breast or what have you is yep. it okay for me to put this right here okay now i'm getting ready to put this right here i mean you just you have to be really really deliberate and that yeah, way, there's nothing there to confuse, you know? Once, you know, once it gets to like where you're working with a brand, different levels like that, and if you're going to have to do anything where if there's anything that you need to place on them that they don't need to place on themselves, you need to bring a female assistant with you. Yeah. So yeah. that's just the way that we that I would do it. Um, um, and, you know, I, I there was never any issues, but I know that, you know, there's there's a lot of like fantasy about what photography, you know, is. And I don't think that's really the reality of it. So, right. Right. Yeah, um, I've so said then, you know, you pick your model, you go to your location scouting. That's mm -hmm. the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I was always looking for places and I would take a picture with my phone whenever I saw anything that looked interesting, an alley, uh, a wall, anything like that. 
And then I would put in a Google Doc and I would write down where the location is because a lot of times I would just take a photo and forget where it was at the beginning. Mm. I'm and not going to admit lot- to doing that ever. <laughs> <laughs> And there's lots of places like that, you know, where you'll go and do something. Now, also remember, if, if it's a business, you need to get permission. Yep. If there's a wall with a graffiti art on it, yep. I see a lot of people think, oh, it's cool. I'm going to go take a picture in front of this. Uh, one of the photographers who used to work um, for Low Pro did that. And then I think we paid $10,000 in the lawsuit. Yeah. yeah. For the having the image in the background. Yeah. Um, so... You know, there's things like that that you can't do. You can't have other people's art or be in places that you're not supposed to be, kind of. I mean, if you can't tell where it is, I don't know if it it makes a difference. But if you can, then you're going to get in trouble. All right. Now, I want to I want to take a few moments and and look at some of your images uh, because I got a couple of them here and I'm just going to scroll through them on the screen and have you walk through them Uh, because there's there's so daggum good and there's so clever and i see not only the brand messaging in it but i also see your personality and in your a a bit of you in images as well but before that i want to just pause for a second and just give a shout out to everybody out there that is supporting the show via club twit all right so folks look club twit is our members only plan that allows you to get ad free versions of all the shows here on the twit network look here we know that this is a bit of a pandemic time and some people are struggling financially and we know that this means uh even ads are going to sort of trickle in and not come in as much to help support twit tv well with your support you're going to be able to help support us and and supplement us uh, to be able to continue to keep creating these shows such as my show hands-on photography for just seven bucks a month. And again, you get the show ad free. You get access to the discord server, which has a ton of people on there talking all the time about a a bunch of different uh, ideas and topics and just random conversations. It's a lot of fun. Plus you get access to our Twit Plus feed that has uh, things like the AMA that I recently hosted with Alex Lindsay from MacBrick Weekly or with Steve Gibson, just a fireside chat with him. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, We also have corporate group plans too. So check us out, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up again. It's just seven bucks a month. That's pretty much a very fancy cup of coffee that you have to sacrifice once a month to help support me and help support all of us at twit TV. I appreciate your support. All right, so I'm sitting here with Mr. Zach Sediwong, and he has a ton. <laughs> he has a ton of images that I really just want to take a look at um, based on just the lifestyle uh, version of the product photography. This one got my attention because of the facial expressions and everything else that's going on in the background. We have two gamers here. We have a camera f- uh, with on a Joby gorilla pod there and a couple of arms coming off of it. Looks like those are looks like that may be a key light system from them and a microphone attached to it. And it's just a beautiful, fun <laughs> gaming environment that totally says, you know what? Yeah, these are hardcore gamers having a lot of fun and just just chips everywhere. There's caffeine everywhere. And Walk me through this shot, because I know you also included a little bit of a behind the scenes with it as well. So for this shot, we needed uh, one that was going to show like a remember, you you might think there's a ton of money that's being spent, but I would get a budget throughout the year and then I would have to allocate it. So sometimes I didn't have as much because I went and did like other shots that were, you know, took thousands. Mm -hmm. So for this one, I needed a cool gaming shot. I picked two people in our um, office. Those are a low pro designer on the left, Ian Hughes, and Mario Drew on the right, who was our social media person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took our lobby. I decorated it to look like a gamer's room. I then ran down the street to the store, bought a bunch of like products that we could all snack on later. And then we needed to create things. Like we needed to have the television look like it was shining out in front of them. Right. And regular soft boxes are not going to do that. So you can see I have the cardboard box there. Yep. The cardboard box gave me those sharp edges that I needed to look like a television right. was there. You created a large snoop, essentially. 
Right. So <laughs> we moved everything around, got it ready. And then we did a bunch of them where they were throwing the, Ian was throwing up the chips like he was mad. <laughs> and the shots, you know, it turned out great because they're on brand, they're on point. They cost us literally, you know, not much to do. Everyone in the office likes them because they're with people from the office. Um, and for me, the creativity of placing all the different lights, I, I would say in that shot, I mean, there's a light you can see and the lights you can't. There's mm -hmm. probably eight, 10 lights and then, you know, moving things around. So something like that would take me four hours to set up and then we'd have it shot in 30 minutes. Wow. Wow. So when you come into a shot like this, um, is it like pre-production planning? You know, what's that like? Is this something that you literally just sketch down yourself or, or the sometimes team comes together? Sometimes there's pre-production planning. Um, if you scroll down to the two images where the people look like they're in a war zone kind of. Okay. So for some, you know, sometimes when you head out, you get a product brief and um, a creative director or the brand team at that time will sit down and figure out what they want to do. So in a large company, the way this usually works is all the way back when they're just designing the, the bag, they're mm -hmm. making the bag, the first prototype comes, there's probably like three different prototypes. It's like a year long process. Yep. In this point, we're figuring out who the customer is, who we're gonna go after, um, all the different salespeople are in the room. So if I just run off on my own and I decide this is what I'm gonna shoot, everybody has a different idea of what that bag, what they want it to do, especially all the salespeople. Yeah. So in a large company like that, you need to go in ahead of time, attend all those meetings, all the design meetings and everything, and get everybody focused together. That's pretty much the creative director job. You need to get them all focused towards your vision if you can. But if not, a lot of times other people in the room will have better ideas. And the moment they do have a better idea, drop your idea and go with their idea. Yeah. So for this yeah. one- Don't have an ego about it, right? Right. For this one, it was, we want to have them look like they're a, war, a, photo, a wartime photographer out there in some sort of rooms, but we still need to have the product like in focus. Yeah. So we picked this derelict building. Uh, we made it look like there's a uh, helicopter spotlighting the bags you yep. know, below. Yeah. On the one below, the guy's like jumping over the uh, the desk. And we had some where they were like up against a vault door. So all of those followed a brief and we got a, uh, a mood board sheet I got that was for that. Now, if you go up a little bit, you'll see a motorcycle. So for that shot, <clears throat> this one doesn't have anything. This is where they just tell you, you know what, go out there and just get us something. We have no idea what we need. <laughs> so, and this is also a good, a good shot to show people. This is when I'm first starting out. This is probably the first image I did for Joby working for them. Wow. So I don't have a bunch of professional like um, uh, strokes at the time. This is shot using the headlights off a car and little tiny Joby LED flashlights behind the motorcycle. And oh. I am on the motorcycle and I'm taking the photo. Oh. Okay, so what we did is this, is we set up the camera to where it's just literally going click, 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 the camera's just taking photos. Yeah. Have nice. everything staged, have the lights, take two photos. One I took before I started of the product, so it's in focus. And then I do the other one behind. Yeah. Then start doing the burnout. And as the smoke goes, it changes the different level of the thing. Yeah. That is right. That is the parking garage downtown Petaluma, right above the fire station at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> this is so badass. So I did that one. And, and things like that, you know, would happen a lot. I would say 50% of the time, there was an Apple package. And they're like, hey, we just heard that we're going to be uh, in Apple and we have to come up with a new product. We have to have the artwork to them in two hours. Oh boy. We need a lifestyle image for the back. That's when I just grab somebody out of the office, run downtown Petaluma, take one shot, run back, and then the team edits it and it, off it goes. Dude. And you have two hours to do it. Um, this is ridiculous. I love this shot, man. And then, so there was gonna be this backpack for these um, quad guard uh, um, drone backpacks. Mm -hmm. Now at the time, there wasn't really any drone specific backpacks. Nope. So they sent me out and there was a lot of research on this. Go out and figure out who these drone enthusiasts are. So I go out and it's a bunch of guys in lawn chairs and parking garages. That's who they were. And they're like, this is what we want to shoot. And I'm like, eh. shooting who they are 
isn't going to sell the product, yeah. shouldn't even they have aspirations to be will. So what I did is I created a survey and yeah. I asked them at the time, what are you interested in? What do you do besides race drones? Number one thing, play Xbox. And I play the division, which is the game at the top. You can yeah. see that image at the top there. Yeah. They played the division. Division was the number one selling game at that time. We went and grabbed the hero image off, off the division. And we then focused our entire campaign oh, around that look. That's just brilliant. So we got the, the yeah, and that's all real drone stuff on the back there. And we use massive smoke grenades. We got permission to shoot inside this uh, parking garage, which is in uh, Santa Rosa, right above... Uh, and then the, those are the designers right there. Those are the designers of the bag. And they're there on every shoot a lot of times to make sure that the product's being shown in the way they want it to be shown, that things are accurate and correct. Because wow. if you don't know how a strap is supposed to go or anything, and you shoot a whole series and you come back, right? and right. they're like, why did you hang that on the back? That's the wrong pocket. That's a water bottle, not a tripod pocket. Right, right, right. Then you just wasted a whole bunch of money. So. Wow, dude, these are unbelievable. And this is you here. That's me. That's a lot of times I like to use primes, but on that, you know, for something like that, you know, 7,200 is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Wow. I freaking um, love this. Yeah, I, I love the concept of you, you said, you know, I need to, I need to do a survey. <laughs> I need to do a survey that, that, yeah. that is that saved you so much work in the end, right? Just knowing exactly what these, what this particular group of people had, had, in, had in mind as far as their favorite interests and stuff, and then trying to figure out how to make it work with the brand that I'm sure that just doing the survey saved you several days of extra work. Yeah. And you know, for something like that, I have to go back not only to the, um, the brand managers, yeah. there's going to be the uh, CEO, there's going to be all the sales team. Right. And I'm going to have to sit down in front of probably 15, 20 people. And they're looking at, okay, worldwide, this is going to go in, you know, I don't know, 3,000 stores. We're going to buy out billboards and B&H, the sides. We're going to do all this stuff. All this money is going to go towards marketing. And if we fail, it's going to cost us a huge amount of money. So if I go in there and I show them photos of the actual guys, what they wanted, and then I show them an aspirational, maybe this is the way we could go. And then I say, I got 35 of them to go through and write down. I asked them a whole bunch of questions about the lifestyle. And he, look, this is what they're all doing. So I think it's better to sell the aspiration than what they actually are. Like all of them think when they're out there flying their drone, they're the dude with the backpack and the smoke going around. Yeah. That's what they want to be, right? Right. <laughs> That's the image. They're like, this is what I do. But they're not showing themselves sitting there with a bag of Doritos flying the ship with their iPhones, right? <laughs> behind a Subaru. That's, that's not how it's going to work. So when you go back to these meetings, you have to be able to sell it. Yeah. Otherwise you are going to be selling dudes in lawn chairs and things and the product won't sell. Right. And, and it's going to reflect not, on you as if it was your fault. All right. If the products don't sell, you're not going to be working there very long. Right. So that bag's pre-sold just from our marketing stuff. Oh, we sold hundred percent of the inventory. Like I think three months before we even did it. When we went to the Drone World Championships in Hawaii that year, someone had bought like 50 of them because you couldn't get them anywhere and was selling them to everybody there. And every single person had one of the bags. <laughs> wow. That's so it was like a huge success for us. That is an awesome test of it. Now, I want to look at one more image. Um, actually, this is 200. This, this one is probably <laughs> a bit more intimate. So let me see if I can switch my okay. screen here. I can't help but laugh at it because I know the story a little bit of it. So there, let's. Oh, wait, this is a good one. <laughs> okay, so this is a studio shot. Mm -hmm. It is made up of a bunch of different things. First thing I would tell anybody out there, if you're going to really get serious into doing any sort of brand or studio photography, mm -hmm. you need to really, you, Lightroom is going to work for headshots and you know, stuff like that, uh, weddings maybe, but it's not going to work for hardcore studio photography. You need to really master Photoshop. Yeah. You need to get in there to where I, I was probably way more skilled at Photoshop before I ever picked up a camera. Right. Um, Impressive. So I knew what I wanted to do. And me and my wife's like, let's create something awesome for our anniversary. So we're huge gamers and that's us in the division right there in that shot. 
So what we did is we bought like that's a uh, airsoft. Those are airsoft guns. They're not real guns, by the way. They're just fake. Mm-hmm. I bought the guns really cheap, and I I went out and one. To describe this one, I have to explain something. The most important tool for a studio photographer is a measuring tape. So you need to measure where the camera is from the ground for every single shot, Uh where the camera is to the product. Mm -hmm. You need to look at the product, figure out how you're going to place it. And I can go over that a little bit later. But so for that shot, we measured the camera to the ground. We measured the backgrounds. We figured out where it is going to be in the final image in the studio, then went and shot the the room and the alley with the camera in those same locations as though it was in the middle of them. Those are our two back end uh, plates for uh, Photoshop. Then we go back to the studio. In the studio, we put down a, I believe it was a white background. Then we took a door and there's a door in the middle that's just hanging from the ceiling. So it's a regular wood door hanging from the ceiling. That is our wall. <laughs> At the end of the door, I extended it with um, some, I think, foam core. And I punched a hole with a Sharpie. Then I took some sidewalk chalk, crunched it up. And in one photo, and remember, the camera's locked down. Yeah. So my wife, and I'm using a remote so I don't move it at all. Yeah. So my wife stood up and she blew the sidewalk chalk through the hole. And that's where we get the bullet um, wow. and the particles. And it looks like the door is exploding. Wow. That's literally just pieces that we shot through a straw on the other side. Okay. So then this is unbelievable. Is a smoke machine. We added that smoke machines in the room. Mm-hmm. Lighting. She's there. We use a tiny puff of smoke behind her, but then we also like this, I think I enhanced the smoke on her. It's just a tiny bit, but mm-hmm. there was a tiny bit of real smoke there. The only, the, the thing that's only thing I really added was the bullet. The bullets, the only thing that is an asset I got from somewhere and I stuck on wow. everything else. There is literally shot in a studio and just layered and thought out of how am I going to layer these things one on top of each other and get the lighting correct. You have to match the lighting to the two images that you used from before. Right. And I would say this took us the entire day, probably maybe six to 10 hours. It took a whole day. And you said this was for your anniversary. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did for anniversary. That's my Xbox gamer tag on the left there. So. <laughs> this is just, oh, that's a hell of a story. But man, this image is just... Mm, this is tough. I got the best Xbox gamer tag there. Yeah. Uh, icon profile image, whatever that there is. <laughs> <laughs> that is so daggum awesome. So you said Photoshop was your thing um, before even picking up a camera with, mm-hmm. uh, with that said, um, have you ever thought about getting more into photo finishing in addition to, you know, in addition to sh- shooting the content that you create. Have you ever thought about getting into to photo finishing? Because you clearly have the skills. Yeah, but I clearly don't have the desire to do anybody else's photos. <laughs> so, you know, Fair enough. Like, so working with the team in LowPro there, I would shoot in the studio. Mm-hmm. We would have, say, Joby would come out with, I don't know, between both brands, maybe 160 to 200 different SKU numbers, products every single year. Some of those would take 30 shots per image in the studio. So you can do the math for that. Yeah. So wow. I would be in there shooting nonstop. I would then send those images out to a team that I had. Um, and there was two retouchers, two photo retouchers. They would then break them up. So whenever you shoot for a brand two, they're going to break it up to where it's just the image. And then you have a white background and a black background as a different layer. Yeah. So that that can sent out to be made a whole, make a whole bunch of different ads. Um, so I didn't really have that, you know, all the lifestyle images I did for them. I did my own editing. I didn't let anybody do that. Yeah. So all the lifestyle was me because there's no way to convey that type of what do I want uh, going on here for those images. Right. Right. Um, I did find that, you know, the, the longer I started doing it, the more I tried to get as much as I could in camera. Right. It, it just saves you time, saves you headaches and it's cooler. And then you can say to other photographers, that's all in camera. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Which, you know, it's pretty sweet, right? Hum- I mean, humble anybody brand. Anybody can like just drop something in in Photoshop. <laughs> if you look at the one where um, there's the, the backpack and all the strings and we made that huge cage, mm-hmm. 
Okay, so for this shot, you know, I could have just, I guess, shot everything individually and tried to layer them up in Photoshop to get the uh, image that we were going for. But by doing it, you know, actually doing it physically, having everything there, yep. the shot was going to be so much better because the physics would look perfect. The lighting would look perfect. The shadows would look perfect. Inside the bag, there's even a, a flash in the bag, <laughs> a strobe in the bag. There are strobes everywhere around the room for this thing. It took me one entire day to hang everything. And then the next day, maybe, I want to say six hours to dial in the lights exactly how I wanted them. Yeah. And then press the button once. And most of the strings disappeared and there was just a few for them to take out. And I think the final image is at the top. Yeah. And the thing is, a lot of people, they have no idea that these shots are pretty common. It's pretty common practice to use fishing line uh, is because yep. it's, it, it's, it's light and it doesn't really get in the way in post-processing. You can, like you said, they pretty much disappear with the right yeah, and lighting. Um, and if they don't, you just wipe them away with like one yeah, stroke. <laughs> they disappear easily and um, get a whole bunch of different like uh, strengths because you want to go with the lightest one you can, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's just too small. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like something like that, you know, it's, I'm pretty proud of because the amount of work and everything that goes into it to shoot it. Um, but there were days where I would spend five hours setting up a shot yeah. and I would describe it to the CEO and he'd walk in and he's like, I thought you were, what happened to the shot you were setting up? And I was like, I pressed camera once. I didn't like it. We're starting with something new. <laughs> and you have to realize that you have to be able to see when things are going wrong. Yeah. Because you can't waste time. And there's no sense of like putting something out there that's junk just because you, you said it was going to be awesome five hours ago, but if it's not, yeah, if it ain't there, it ain't there. Don't force yeah, I mean, it. If you make Make a mistake, admit that you made a mistake, you know, don't have any issues like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it is. <laughs> now, before we get out of here, I want you to tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel. About my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So on my YouTube channel, I take objects, like say this fence post here, just mm -hmm. a plain Lowe's fence post. Yep. And I turn them into actual full-on <laughs> working rocket launcher replicas. Um, this one's from The Division, so you can watch that one. Oh, man. I also did like the, I don't know if you can see it back there, but there's a jet pack. There's a jet pack, yeah. A giant jet pack. Whew. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, that's a... The jetpack is a, rep, uh, a replica of, from the film Tomorrowland. So that's almost exact replica, except for I made it a little bit cooler at the end. Um, so you, on my uh, YouTube channel, it's a maker channel. I kind of found that I enjoyed making the props and doing other things yeah. almost as much as I did the photography, maybe even more. Yeah. Um, and then when I started you know, my channel, I haven't done anything in a while because I've been working on my house, but I got to pick it up again. I recorded it thinking it was going to be more like Adam Savage where people like maybe follow my steps. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, God, there's a lot of dumb things that I do and I don't even realize I'm doing them while I'm on camera. <laughs> and those were more interesting. The outtakes were more interesting than the entire video. So I just made those the video. So whenever right. you watch one of my maker videos, you're basically watching when you see me talking to my hey, like, hey, Jack, what are you doing? That's something I didn't realize I was doing while I was doing it. But hey, it's in there, and that's the whole video. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, I'm, but I'm. Can hoping. I give a tip to people out there in the yeah. photography stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Realize that no matter what, the photos you like are the best photos. That right off the bat, I stopped like going to Petapixel or any of those. Yeah. Because I realized, you know, and I don't think it's as bad now. But when I started, the photography field was really harsh mm -hmm. to, bunch of jerks people, bunch of jerks yep <laughs> and it was like nothing but critics and harsh and then i would go and i'd shoot these stuff and i'm like yeah but i'm getting paid well and you're not you know i, I didn't want to argue with them so i just like left the field because it's negative yeah and the reason why i never took a single class for my camera was if i 
think this can do anything, it can do anything. Yeah. There you go you and go. take me to a class. You have me do something. You're telling me what I can do. I've learned. I've learned about the parameters of it. The different, and then I'm going to stay within that mentally because I'm locked into it. And yeah. now I think this is a magic box that can do anything I can imagine. Yeah. And it can. Um, I freaking so, love that sentiment. Love that. Yeah. You pretty much you um you, you you've unlocked it if you will you know it's <laughs> I love that. And just remember, the whole world is predetermined, so no matter what you do, it ain't changing anyways. <laughs> <laughs> the simulation will just keep going on. Okay, Elon. Get off the train. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Elon. Next time on Twit. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh gosh. This is not this week in Google. And I, oh jeez. Oh yeah, I can do that. Oh boy, <laughs> Zach, dude, this this is this is a lot of fun and. A shout out to one of our Twit studio engineers, Mr. Burke. I Man, I'm hoping you're watching this episode. I know you usually watch them all, but this one is definitely for you, especially his YouTube channel, because the stuff that I've seen on there was just ridiculous, man. And I, I, I don't know how you do it, but I salute you because I couldn't do any of that stuff. So thanks. thanks. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to plug before we get out of here? Something that you got coming up or you're working on? Um, you know, the only thing I have is my YouTube channel, which is um, youtube.com front slash my last name, Setawong, S-E-T-T-W-N-G-S-C. Um, and you know what? I'm going to plug a fellow photographer of mine, Peter John Jiraka. All right. Who, uh, you can find him on Instagram. And if you want to follow a photographer who is probably the best photographer in the world right now, I think, that's who I would follow. There you go. See, that's the difference now in the photography community versus you know, decade ago or so, uh, you just came on here to plug somebody else's work. You know, it wasn't right. like that before. It was all secretive and this is my stuff and I'm not going to tell you how I shot it. And it, and, and your shot is crap. And it, you just took the minute to say, you know what, there's another photographer out there that's doing some great stuff. Go check them out. And, and that was just straight from the heart. That's the difference in the community now. And I'm so glad that, people like you are a part of this community, Zach. Real talk. I appreciate that. Could also be that I'm a house husband now, so I don't need to worry about income. <laughs> <laughs> then there's that. <laughs> then there's that. Man, Zach, thanks so much for joining me, my man. Okay. This, this has been a lot of fun, and I hope to have you back on in the future to talk about some more of your projects that you finally tackled and uh, share some other ideas and tips and tricks with the hands-on photography community. Is that cool? Sounds good. I come on anytime you want, and we can go more in, into detail and into specific things if you want to. Sweet. Like Sweet. why the measuring tape is the most important tool you will <laughs> ever have in the studio. I could go on for twenty minutes. See, and and I would have argued gaffer's tape, but I, no. I, why you shouldn't do a hands-on photography thing without having a rubber gloves on when you hold the product? Well, got that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, got that okay, too. I will stop. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, my man. <laughs> All right, everybody. That was Zach Sederwong, the amazing photographer and, and creative director and just all around great content creator. And I love his energy. And I'm so glad that, that I was able to get him on the show. And uh, he reached out and shared some information with me some time back. And I'm glad I was finally able to get him in here and be able to share his knowledge and wisdom and tips and tricks with all of you, the hands-on photography community. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, please feel free to shoot a message to me at hop at twit.tv. Yes, that is an old school email address, folks. That's the best way to get in contact. Hop at twit.tv. Uh, and if you have some image critique requests or just any other general questions or images that you want to share with me, you can send them there. I totally don't mind. And also, don't forget, we have our oops moment uh, episode that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I've only seen uh, a handful of messages, but they didn't have any video. Hey, I want video of you so we can share about the show. I know y'all are fine with doing that, right? So if you got an oops moment, take a video of yourself. Tell us about the oops moment. Let's have some fun. Let's share with the rest of the hands-on photography community. All right, next, give me a follow over on the social media platforms, even though I don't know if it matters anymore on Instagram. I am Ant underscore Pruitt over on Instagram. You can also follow me on Twitter. I am Ant underscore Pruitt there. Thank you so much for all of the continued support. 
Thank you to Mr. Victor for always making me look and sound good in his editing magic of hands-on photography. And folks, safely create and dominate, and we shall catch you next time. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, but your game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow is a show dedicated to it, The Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there.